My life has changed a lot being with this family. I started doing stuff I didn't even realize I could do, you know? Like woodworking, construction, welding. Like actually having fun with family, having a cat, loving a cat. The stuff I didn't think I would have when I was, you know, getting locked up and all that stuff. When I was like 12, it was middle school, and I was hanging around with the wrong friends. It was a lot of um, gang involvement, like just reckless stuff, like doing dumb stuff, you know? So we went out and burglarized the school. We got caught like the next week because I went to the school that we broke into. I went to jail and everybody else went to jail. Juvenile Hall is really, it's not a place people want to go. Getting told what to do, when to shower, when to eat, when to sleep. The Sacramento County probation officer that we were working with um, at the time called and asked if we would be open to taking Jetro as a placement. We went to Juvenile Hall. We did what's called a pre-placement visit. Jetro was pretty, pretty quiet. So, and, and my wife is not quiet. She always has a lot to say and a lot to ask. And ask lots of questions before you take a kid. You can't just, you know, get a kid and send them back. It's not healthy for them. It takes a while for me to open up to people I hardly know, especially, you know, random people from the system. Coming to see me is like very awkward and I'm shy. The conversation started turning toward, hey, well, if you had another living arrangement, how would this work? And he decided to, hey, we'll, we'll give this a shot. And it's always their decision, too. I chose Hillary and Kevin. We offered. He accepted. And then I came to their house, like, probably like 36 hours later. I AWOLed. He ran away. <laughs> he jumped the back fence and <laughs> took off. I was still connected to my old life, so it was, like, very hard for me to disconnect and actually, you know, be successful with the family. One of my friends got shot. He picked me up and he was like limping and stuff. She was telling me the situation. I was kind of like, dang, I should have just stayed because this is, he got shot in the butt, he's fine. So why didn't you come back? Because I felt guilty. I didn't want to, I come back and you guys are like, that's going to be like really awkward kind of and a lot of trust issues. Trust issues, what does that mean? Like us not trusting you or you not trusting us? No, I would say you guys not trusting me because well, yeah. I just hopped a fence. <laughs> yeah, that does, that does break trust, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. To hear him describe it and what his decision making was about, he was dealing with a crisis at this specific time that caused him some pain and he felt like he had to do something about it. So he's gone. It wasn't about us. And that's an important lesson. Short time later, he got picked up by probation. He spent some time in the youth detention facility and then ended up in a congregate care setting. And probation had asked, hey, would you ever be open to taking him back into placement? So in Jetro's case, you know, him running away became this moment where, oh, you know, what might his future be? And, you know, I think we reached out to Hillary and her husband and uh, they were like, well, we're, we're willing to give this another shot. And I was like, sure, he only AWOLed, he didn't hurt us, he didn't do anything terrible, he just ran. Don't assume that bad decisions make a bad person. We as adults all know that kids make mistakes. We recognize that people can change and obviously kids are still developing, still growing. A young person with our help can remake as well. Remake themselves, remake their mindset, remake their decision making, reframe the way that they do things. We decided, hey, we will make this overture again. With Jetro, we went out and visited him at his group home for four months before he was placed with us. Kevin, myself, our two grandchildren that were living with us at the time, and our two other foster children that were in placement, Boy. we all went as a family to visit. It was about the household building relationship. We would pick up on a, on a Saturday afternoon, load up that van and, and drive that hour and a half to go, to go see him and just, 
you know, start the process all over again. He struggled so, so horribly in that congregate care setting. He was shut down, he wouldn't talk. I was shocked. I didn't, um, I didn't think that they would actually come back and see me. Um, I thought they didn't care. It was awkward because I awalled from him. It's like breaking their heart. It's like stealing from him and then going back and see them. It was really awkward. It was hard. One time we went out and he wouldn't even come into the visit. So we sat there where he could see us and we ate pizza and played games. So he knew we're not going anywhere. We're still here for you. It's okay to have a hard day. We're still, we still care. And then we went back the third time and he came back and he visited with us. And it was hard for him, but it was just about breaking through that, that wall. And that, that made a difference for him. A lot of people don't get second chances. I'm blessed I got a second chance to live with this foster family. I'm a black man in America, and I know what happens to young men of color. The path to prison or the path to homelessness or the path to just being caught up in street life that no one should be caught up into was just really clear. So many of our kids come from challenged backgrounds, whether they've experienced trauma or been you know, subject to violence or other issues in their home and in their community. There's oftentimes a situation at home that's not stable where the parents are dealing with their own issues or are absent in many cases. Yes, we can see what charges have been mounting up against a young man, but Really, what's behind that? I wouldn't get caught up in they're the bad kids or the good kids or the troubled kids. They're all the same kids who've struggled and experienced trauma and neglect and are trying to overcome that. And it's just about do they have the emotional coping skills to, to do that? The juvenile justice and the dependency systems, they're often the same kids. Similar situations at home, similar situations in their, in their environments similar decisions that they're making to, to cope with their pain and their trauma. And some get caught up in the law enforcement and juvenile justice systems and some don't. So the needs are, are very much similar, if not the same. Kevin and I both work in the children's system of care. I'm kind of on the, the statewide policy side and she's been direct service for a long time. One of the things that we kept seeing were poor outcomes for youth of color, particularly boys of color, and we were not okay with that. We were tired of seeing that. Since we met, for Pete's sake, we've been, <laughs> we've been kinda on the front lines, either in the policy realm or in direct service, where we're actually, you know, putting in, putting in the work on behalf of all kids. Right. So my question to you is, well, why isn't that enough for you? Because I can't not do anything. I can't, now I'm going to really cry. <laughs> I can't not make a difference. I mean, the damage that's done to these kids by the system, by parents who can't take care of them, I can't stand by and do nothing and watch that. I want to make sure that I, instead of just talking about um, inequalities, I want to be part of the addressing of that in a specific, tangible way. So we decided to become resource family. I'm married to a woman who, how do I say, a woman who leaps into action. I'll just put it that way. I knew of a reputable uh, foster family agency, FFA. And so I reached out to them and said, hey, we would like to be a foster family. One of the things we learned is that it was particularly difficult to find homes for boys of color. And so we wanted to make sure that we clearly shared that that's who we are open to and really um, wanted to serve. We have a gift for young adolescent males. We can deal with that. Uh, and all that comes with that, good, bad, ugly, in between. I've always had a heart for probation youth. Sometimes people see the probation kids as the bad kids versus the victims. The stigma is, is misplaced in that a lot of people make mistakes, as we know, and it's really what you do with those opportunities thereafter that matter the most. And so a resource family can help with that opportunity. They can really bridge that gap to success for our youth. I think many of the challenges that we face are fairly normal for families with teens. I'm guessing when you're out there running the streets, doing your thing, you're not used to having people in your business. Not at all, no. I'm going to be in your business. 
all your business, all your business. So who you're chilling with, who you're talking to, where you're going, what you're doing, like all of it, all of it. I will be in all your business because that's what parents do. Are you ready for those kind of rules? Because I'm not going to play with you. I'm going to be honest with you. She could really relate to me and it's like made a, a connection between me and her. I know what the streets offer. I know what it is. I lived in South Sac, <laughs> like for real. I'm not scared of the South because I lived in the South. Any of your boys that you be rolling with, they don't scare me. She's very open, so I opened up to her and it just took off from there. It's been good ever since. When you show them that you actually care, that undoes their world. Because trust is hard with kids who've been hurt a lot. Why there's so much animosity towards the women in general with some of these young kids? I don't know. Man. Unless something, is this, or unless it's a mom thing. I don't know. I, I, I think it might be a mom thing, man. I wasn't aware of the mommy issues that boys experience. That's been really difficult for almost every young man that's come in here being able to just relate to a female. <laughs> when we first got boys into care and I experienced their hostility towards the mother figure, it kind of shocked me. And because I'm the primary caregiver, that can be really challenging. And I'm glad I'm here as a, as, as a kind of father figure because I get to be, um, a support and a boundary to that in those situations where a kid grew up raising up on a woman, I'm there to say, hey, here's how you relate to a, a woman even when you disagree with her. I can't tell you how many times I've been told, you're not my mom. <laughs> okay, I'm not your mom, but I'm your foster mom, so deal with it, right? Um, you kind of have to have thick skin in those moments. I mean, if you're growing up in a house where everyone's cussing each other out and all that, and that's all you, that's the way you know how to communicate, then that's what you deal with here. We want it to be a place where we learn how to communicate and interact so that when we go out into the world, we're not just, we're not bulls in China shops and just breaking everything up around us and breaking up the people that we most want to connect with. So some of the best parts about being a resource parent are those aha moments where you have a kid and you're trying to teach them something and I mean, you're going through it. You're, you're, you're fighting about it. You're arguing about it. And then all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and, and you're like, yes, yeah, see, you got it, right? Or for us, vocabulary of words they don't understand. And when one of the kids used facetious correctly, we we're like, yes, that's awesome. Moderation, man. You gotta learn the meaning of that word. What is that? Everything in moderation, like not too much, not too little. I mean, and we celebrate those moments because it shows that they're growing. And while that may seem little, it's communication. And a lot of these kids struggle to communicate. They communicate with their behaviors, not their words. A lot of them have learned not to ask for help because that's a scary thing. That's something that either they were shut down and told not to ask, or when they did, they didn't get the help. So it made it something that wasn't worth doing. And so when they're able to say, hey, I don't understand the schoolwork. Can you help me? Or um, I don't, I don't know how to tell this to this person. Can you please help me communicate to this other person? Then you know you're making gains. We'll be on the front line and present young people some options. You know, we're gonna present you another choice. Another choice that looks as good as or better than the knucklehead move you were about to make. You gotta make wise choices now so you don't create barriers for yourself later. Life sucks. <laughs> Life sucks? <laughs> a lot of good to it too, but you can make it suck a lot less if you plan and execute on what your intention is. I mean, just follow through, man. That's the thing that Kevin and I have to tell every kid. We are here to help you. We care. Yes, you don't like the rules. Yes, you get frustrated that there's accountability, but if we didn't care, we wouldn't set the rules. We wouldn't hold you accountable. You only have till the end of the month. You have to meet your AB 12 requirements. 20 hours a week of work, or more, mm. or be going to school. 
you didn't pay back the financial aid when you dropped those classes. You spent it on something else or other things. Yeah. So now you owe the school the 200 bucks. But I had, I had FAFSA though. But you have to complete the classes. So what are we gonna do, man? I'm gonna get this job done till the end of the month. I'm pretty sure I should have enough money to pay off my financial aid. There has to be a, a presentation of other options to go in a, in a more positive direction. And if a system doesn't have that for a kid, then we, we deserve what we get as a society. I actually love working with probation. We've had seven children placed in our home, five of them with probation. The great thing is that our, our probation officers partner with us to make sure that that structure and those boundaries are there and they enforce those boundaries. I think we recognize the value that we have in, in our resource families and specifically the Gaines family. Providing this loving structure is really what kids need. We think it's been a really good partnership and here's how. Number one, you get the support of a probation officer. Because we specialize in kids with high risk needs, we need the support from the county worker. Well, we have essentially an officer assigned to just manage the resource family caseload and we can have so much of a, a positive impact, it's pushed us to really think differently about how we engage. Anthony Mays, he's a very great PO too. I would say he's very, like he's heck nice. I don't even know what, what else to say, but he's a nice guy and he enjoys working with kids like me. Kevin and I have been very fortunate to work with Sacramento County Probation and, and they're really focused on the adolescent brain and how it develops, on really having relational supervision model versus an authoritarian supervision model. And I think that really makes a difference. I've seen a real shift in how the officers respond to us and the youth. There are kids that we've had that they don't know how to manage their emotions, and so they might have outbursts or tantrums. They're not trying to hurt anybody. They're not sophisticated or criminal. However, there's some conduct stuff. And so having a worker that's really involved makes it possible to keep them with us versus having to kind of flail about our, on our own. Reach out to us if there's ever an issue. You can reach out to the assigned officer. You can reach out to myself and we're going to immediately begin to work with you to address the issue. We're going to put services in place if it's a behavior issue. Sometimes it's really supportive to have a probation officer come to the house and begin to remind the youth, these are the conditions of probation and you have to toe the line. You have to do your piece. So we have a piece, you guys have a piece, but the youth also has a piece. The probation officer that is serving our family and that youth right now is like on top of it weekly calls to make sure that the other outside agencies are doing their part to serve the youth as well so it takes a lot of that like case management pressure off of us so we can really focus on supporting the kids if we need to invest in an activity that that will help um move a, a young person toward a, another set of options uh, they've been there to support that. Uh, we have a basketball hoop out in the front yard right now that we were able to purchase with gift cards from probation. They bought Jetro a bicycle and golf clubs. Traditionally, in government, we don't think about making those types of purchases. But as we now think about doing things differently, you know, yes, we should be able to be more agile with regard to acquiring things that can help a family be successful. And more than the gift cards, <laughs> they're really responsive when we're struggling. So sometimes kids have really big behaviors that are challenging to deal with and they're kind of tiring to deal with, to be honest. And so instead of letting us just get burnt out and spin out, they are there to support and reinforce and remind the youth of their requirements and their expectations. We also have to prepare for, you know, what happens when the youth blows out or has a bad day. Or, and so that for us has really um, forced us to be really nimble with regard to applying supports. They've also supported us with uh, a team of individuals to help a young man kind of recraft his, his direction. We have a child and family team that we're a part of that includes probation, includes therapists, includes skills trainers to help with various aspects of a case plan to, to give 
uh, a young man a broader set of options that lead to a great outcome. Making officers available whenever you know a resource family may have specific needs, calling child and family team meetings together when necessary to address you know moments of crises. It allows a venue for youth voice, family voice to be heard in a more real way. And so CFTs provide that opportunity for them to speak in real time to all of the partners with regard to their strengths, their weaknesses, their desires, and what they want to see for the young person. We do those supports um, both with the officers as well as with wraparound services when necessary so we can involve you know, our other partners as you know, there are things probation's great at and then there are things that we know there are other experts who can you know, help provide and, and complement our, our work with. We take the kids with us pretty much everywhere we go. So we go on a family trip to see my adult son and his family. The kids go with us. I would say I want to be like Hillary's son. His name is Jeremiah. I look up to him because he has everything, a nice paying job, um, a car, um, dirt bikes and mountain bikes. Um, he has a girlfriend, but I don't, I don't think I want a girlfriend. Um, I just want a cat and travel the world. Feel it on the pole now? Now give it a little bit of gas. Let it out a little more and you gotta keep getting more gas. I dropped my phone, I think I cracked it. You yeah, probably, probably would have been a good idea to meet up there. So you can ride it, but don't be trying to pop wheelies and go fast because this is more powerful. You don't even know what you're doing yet. I do, I, I, I feel it. Yeah, well, you're gonna feel it on that noggin and be wearing diapers pretty soon. <laughs> now, of course, traveling with them is always fun. It's work, but it's always fun because they get to see these things that they had no idea existed on the planet. Most of the kids we work with and, and have lived with us have never been outside of their neighborhood, unless it's been to a group home, right? But taking them to the snow for the first time or to the beach for the first time, on an airplane for the first time, those things are so eye-opening for them. And they start to learn and discover there's a world that they can access that they never dreamed of, that was never expressed to them. So it gives them a much more normalized and nurturing. See, the nurturing is what happens here in a family home. What I want for young people who come to live here is to be able to relax and know that, that there's safety here and that there's a place where people can be themselves without having to bang up against other people. What I want home to be for me is uh, peaceful, chill, um, no drama, always fun. Like. And for sure, safety. Yeah, I think safety and honesty is probably the biggest one. One of the things that Kevin and I had to come to realize is that we could only help one or two kids at a time, but we change generations by helping those kids. Jetro's generation moving forward is going to be completely different than what he came from because of being here. He was able to be impacted by the care and the love and the interactions and the experiences. Kids are all different. They all come with their own sets of challenges, wants, and needs, and deserve a family that can help them achieve those goals. Almost every kid we've ever had in placement with us has contacted me and said, thank you. Now I get what you are trying to teach me. Kids that have left because they were mad. I should have stayed. Now I get it. They won't stop until you're successful type stuff. Um, they're very good parents. 
they don't even know you and they still love you. Like it's nice for, for them to actually care about people they don't even know. There's a whole sea of people out there who are just dying to help. And it's really exciting to see what happens when we all work together and follow through. Home is really, um, it's where your uh, wishes and dreams can all be explored, but it's also when you, when you get out of line or step too far one way, you can be brought back kind of to the center. No, I feel like this is home. Yeah. I feel like even when you grow up and move away. I, I'll still think this is home. Okay. So you'd be like, have babies, those would be my grandbabies. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, he is our kid. He is our family. And there's not gonna be any changing that. There's no undoing that. <laughs> you like it? <laughs>